You probably wouldn't listen to a podcast about classic films if you didn't love motion pictures. But have you ever literally walked inside a movie? Well, of course you haven't. This is reality, Greg. But still, who hasn't wanted to magically become Chrissy in Jaws or Sonny in The Godfather or Vincent in Pulp Fiction? All right, those are tremendously bad examples because they all meant gruesomely violent ends. But becoming part of the movie can remain a wish all the same. And it would be even funkier if you were able to take a cup of spark plug coffee in your fantasy with you. Let's say the movie is from 99 years ago, like Sherlock Jr. is, and you brought a modern mug and a steaming hot product inside that mug that didn't even exist in 1924. Buster Keaton and his castmates would be so impressed, and they'd probably stop all their scheming and stealing to get some of what you have. They'd say, spark plug coffee? That stuff needs to be part of my early 20th century life. Can I even save a little money if I use something called a computer and type in some letters that would reduce my bill by 20%? And you'd say, yes. Or this being a silent movie, you'd let the title card say yes for you as you mouthed along. Spark Plug Coffee has been the sponsor of this podcast since we were still known as the Top 100 Project. Okay, that was our name until as recently as last week. But our partnership does go back to 2014. They've got fairly traded, premium Arabica beans that are the freshest in Canada. They know how to cater to your taste, whether you prefer decaf like my father-in-law or whether you're a Goldilocks and go for half-calf. They've even got rotating seasonal blends, so you don't have to get tired of the same old delicious thing that you loved in June, since it's currently the dead of winter. And if you live in the United States, or if you're a Canadian like I am, then you'll get your custom-roasted spark plug order delivered straight to you in a week. Or less. Probably less. And the shipping in Canada? It's absolutely free. Of course, they'll let you order it whenever you need some. This isn't a bean dictatorship, for crying out loud. But Sparkplug suggests you join the Autopilot Coffee Club. You get your orders regularly, but the how often is flexible, and you can customize it. And being a member means you can take advantage of deals and other perks that non-members can only dream of, whether they're doing that dreaming while on the job or doing it in their comfy, comfy bed. You also save some buckaroos on every order compared to what you would shell out for a one-time buy. I mentioned the 20% discount a while back, but I don't think I mentioned the promo code. Jot this down, because it's not even a week old. H-Y-E-S for Have You Ever Seen? That, or go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. The winter is far from over, and you'll need classic movies to help you endure the dark drudgery. I'm imploring you, quietly, because after all, we're about to talk about a silent movie, to go to sparkplug.coffee. Now, Andrew Luther, hit that theme song, and action! Have you ever seen Sherlock Jr.? And I have. Hello, film fans. This is Ryan Ellis, the man who failed detective school and never worked in a movie theater either, thanking you for pressing that play button to hear the 483rd podcast that's now known as Have You Ever Seen? We spent close to a full decade being called the Top 100 Project, but that name was passé a very long time ago, and we finally found something that makes a little more sense. Scroll back, though, and you'll see all those motion picture classics that have the Top 100 Project brand in our extensive catalog. I'll be reviewing and fully spoiling Buster Keaton's comedy classic, Sherlock Jr., by myself today. My wife, Bev, will be across the table from me on Monday when we yap about Out of Sight. I'll keep doing these solo episodes every other Friday, by the way, although I'm posting another one of these in just seven days for reasons I'll explain at the end of this show. Okay, let's set this up. The 45-minute silent film, Sherlock Jr., was released by Metro Pictures Corporation, not MGM, Metro Pictures Corporation, nearly a full century ago on May 11th, 1924. People seem to be willing to throw some money on the counter to see Buster Keaton do his thing. Now, other than the Stone Faces cameo on Sunset Boulevard, we haven't covered a Keaton flick since the summer of 2013, so this channel is very overdue to look at another one. And this movie has plenty of kudos that come with it. First of all, it's beloved by Rotten Tomatoes critics. 93% of them dug the picture, or dig the picture, with an average score of 9.8 out of 10. Man, on the strength of 27 reviews, 95% of audiences like it too. It also alternates between 194th and 195th on the IMDb's top 250. Every time I look, it's a different number, but it's one of those two. And to be timely, Sherlock Jr. ended up tied with four other films, including Blade Runner and The Apartment, for 54th on the most recent Sight and Sound poll. The National Film Preservation Board added this to their registry in 1991, only three years into their effort to preserve the classics. We've covered nine other flicks that were entered into the NFR that year. Chinatown, City Lights, Frankenstein, 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 the 1933 King Kong, Lawrence of Arabia, The Magnificent Ambersons, A Place in the Sun, Shadow of a Doubt, and 2001, 
A Space Odyssey. Sherlock Jr. ranked 62nd on the American Film Institute's Top 100 Laughs, and it was nominated for the AFI's 2007 100 Years 100 Movies list. Buster Keaton has had a renaissance ever since they released that big box set about 10 years ago. I think on DVD, maybe Blu-ray too. But it seems the man was gaining in esteem with the AFI even earlier than that. So when I started doing these One Ryan shows a few months ago, I wanted to have a hook. And I did when I talked about Halloween and A Few Good Men. That hasn't been the case so much with the last couple. In the shop around the corner, the connection was Christmas. And it is a Christmas movie, somewhat. But the first week of January and Buster Keaton don't really go together. Of course, I can review a movie for any old reason, and who's going to stop me? If something is revered, but Bev and I might never get to it, that's a good reason right there. A big drive of mine is to cover as many pictures that made the various AFI lists as possible, the thrills, the passions, the comedies, etc. Also, the recent sight and sound poll has inspired me to not only watch the movies on their top 100 that I had never seen before, but to even consider covering some of them, so maybe that'll happen in the next few months. But beyond those very adequate reasons, do I actually have a hook for Sherlock Jr.? Well, how about this? It's considered one of the greatest of the classic comedies. But is it actually funny? Can you call a film one of the greatest comedies if it didn't make you laugh very much? So we'll come back to that question from time to time throughout the episode. Whether it busted my gut or not, I can confirm that Sherlock Jr. is justifiably famous for the scene where Buster Keaton falls asleep while running a film projector and dreams that he enters the movie he's screening. It's such a creative idea, and it's one that other filmmakers have done their own take on. Woody Allen tried it in The Purple Rose of Cairo, a movie we reviewed on this channel in 2020. Jeff Daniels comes out of the silver screen in that, although Mia Farrow also goes into the film with him later on. I like the comparison as well, that while The Purple Rose of Cairo is a color film, the movie within a movie is in black and white, just like all of Sherlock Jr. is. Buster kicks off his story with a title card that tells us an old proverb says, don't try to do two things at once and expect to do justice to both. So the message is, I guess, don't try to achieve a dream or try to get a better job when you don't really like the one you have. This is not a good proverb. Yes, you should focus on what you're doing, and as they say, be in the moment when you're doing it. But I'm with the projectionist. He didn't see a future in cleaning up movie theaters, so he didn't want to keep doing it, no matter what some bossy proverb tells him. I guess he was quiet quitting long before anyone thought of that phrase. He is interested in being a detective and even studies a book called, quite simply, how to be a detective. I guess detecting for dummies was taken or was long in the future also. The theater manager clearly believes that proverb we just talked about because he makes his briefly mustachioed employee put down the book and sweep up a big pile of garbage. Buster leaves the pile right in the theater's entrance way. No pratfalls result from the pile being directly in the way as I was expecting, but two different women come up and claim they lost a dollar. A lot of money back then, really, isn't it? They both leaf through the trash at different times, mind you. They're not fighting each other while doing it. But since the first one already found the dollar, the projectionist gives up one of his own bucks to the second lady. Such a sucker. See what I said about trying to better himself and do something else for a living? How can he keep doing this job when it's costing him money? The button on this cute scene, it wasn't that funny, but it was cute, is when a very big man comes on the scene, leafs through the refuse himself, and finds a wallet that's just full of money. Since our hero now only has one dollar left, he buys a box of candy for his girl that costs exactly that much. What, no taxes in 1924? Maybe the taxes are built in. Yeah, it could be that. He cleverly turns the one into a four with a pen so he can look like a big spender. Hey, big spender, we surrender. He and the girl, that's what it says in the credits, the girl, sits stiffly in her parlor where he forces an engagement ring on her finger. Trouble is the diamond is so small that she needs his magnifying glass to even get a good look at it. We discovered that the quote-unquote local chic, I guess that's shake, isn't it? Local shake is a rival for the girl's affections. It's always nice when a shake is local. You don't need one of those traveling shakes in your life. Those guys are nothing but trouble, believe me. So he steals her dad's pocket watch, sells it, and brings her a bigger box of candy than the projectionist did. The poor movie man is stone-faced, because he's Buster Keaton, but he calculatedly tosses a banana peel on the floor to make the shake slip and embarrass himself. Naturally, though, Buster Keaton is the one who does the big pratfall. This is the guy who not only did dozens of crazy stunts in his career, but even doubled for his actors and did their stunts sometimes. This banana peel gag is, by his standards, pretty tame and easy peasy. Now, since his book tells him to, the aspiring detective wants to search everyone for the missing watch. But that darn shake had put the receipt from the pawn shop into Buster's pocket, which was clever anyway, but especially considering the dude got four bucks for the watch and Buster's candy supposedly cost four bucks. So he tells the girl's daddy that the projectionist should be searched too. After that revelation, it's hard to blame Pops for telling the projectionist to scram 
and the girl even sadly gives her suitor his tiny ring back. I think. I couldn't really see it without my magnifying glass. Chuckle. One of the highlights of this early part of the film is when Buster takes his book's advice again, this time to follow the shake closely. He tails a few inches behind the bad guy, perfectly mimicking Ward Crane's steps. This is good comic timing on both their parts, but especially Keaton, who has to mimic the guy well enough that he'd be in perfect lockstep with him without actually bumping into him. I'd be surprised if they didn't rehearse this for days and or do a lot of takes. Stuff happens and Mr. Movie Man ends up running on top of a moving train. It's the general before the general. Then he grabs onto the water tower that's hanging over the tracks. As his weight pulls it down, the spout dumps a lot of water on his head and Mr. Keaton hits the ground hard. But he quickly gets up and R-U-N-N-O-F-T's. Apparently this stunt hurt Keaton for real and he nearly broke his neck when he hit the ground. Or maybe that near tragedy happened when he hit the tracks. Yikes. Bev watched the movie with me and asked if this stunt wasn't also in the general. And it might have been. We saw that movie a long time ago. Maybe she was just thinking of that because this scene takes place in a train which is where so much of the action in the general happens, too. It's hard to laugh at a scene like this when you know what happened to the real-life guy. He suffered for his art. He suffered for his soup, Jerry. Anyway, at least the girl doesn't completely write off her stone-faced bow after her dad decided the projectionist just had to be a thief. She goes to the pawn shop on her own and asks the man behind the counter who sold him the watch. And because the villain conveniently happens to be walking by right then, the pawn shopper fingers him. So at least the girl's father won't be walking her down the aisle to marry that lying shake And now I'm ashamed that he's a local shake. He's ruining the town's good name. Why didn't Buster give any of these characters actual names? He did sometimes. His character in The General was Joe or something. The projectionist goes back to work and screens a motion picture called Hearts and Pearls for a rapt audience. I guess I can start calling him Sherlock now because our man falls asleep on the job and his spirit comes out of his body. Obviously, this is just what he's dreaming about, which we know is true even more so when we see the girl and the watch dealer are characters in the movie he's playing. Which finally brings us to my movie in a nutshell. So Sherlock Jr. in a nutshell. Pop time dreamer. Long live Spinal Tap. Anyway, now comes the red letter moment when Buster Keaton goes right into the movie. The other two characters take a hike and we get some excellent timing with the gags where the scenes keep changing. And Sherlock keeps getting put into peril. He's falling into a busy street. Then he's nearly falling off a cliff. Then he's caught between two lions. This is a great example of how this movie wasn't so much funny as it was clever. Buster pulled off some crazy gags in his career. But here's perfect proof that he wasn't really improvising them, at least not most of the time, and certainly not in this case. They were carefully planned. This scene-changing sequence had him positioned in exactly the right place as a scene would cut from one shot to another. I'd actually like to know what Hearts and Pearls was about before Sherlock entered the movie. There's no one else on screen other than him during all the cuts to various locations, no one in the foreground interacting with him anyway. Was it a French film that the sight and sound feverishly voted to put on their list? As long as very little is happening, but it's long and it's contemplative, then... It's brilliant. Anyway, the plot in the movie within a movie is that the villain has stolen the pearls and is worried when he finds out the police are sending the world's greatest detective. Say it with me. Sherlock Junior. They never portray Sherlock Senior, although it might have been funny to have an actor play an oblivious Sherlock Holmes. If you're going to name drop the most famous detective of all time, then I wouldn't mind seeing the most famous detective of all time and have a little fun with him. But alas, I'll just have to cry over this disappointment and not laugh. And not really cry either. Anyway, the crime crusher arrives in a fancy hat and tuxedo, sizing everyone up by getting right in their faces. The crime crusher thing is a title card. I didn't make that up. Now, here's something I've been noticing for a while now. Just how often people in old movies get in each other's faces, whether it was a love scene or an interrogation or whatever. I'm talking right in each other's faces. They were all close talkers. Does anyone do this now or did they ever actually do this then? Was everyone nearsighted and deaf, and this helped them see and hear people better? Anyway, the villain and the butler in the meta movie conspire to poison Sherlock, but drinks get switched and no one sips anything that might harm them. And that's good. You can't take out a brilliant mind such as Junior just by tossing bad juice down his throat. That's a little crude. No, you gotta blow him up. The backup plan is to explode the detective with a trick pool ball. The 13 ball is actually a grenade, and the butler has two of them. Dude came prepared. Thank the Holmes that Fast Eddie Keaton hits every ball without hitting the deadly one. In fact, Sherlock shoots stick for a while and puts every ball in a pocket without ever making contact with the rig 13. Then he scratches while making a trick shot before actually hitting a long bank with what was supposedly the bad ball. But nothing happens. Chuckle? Great pool playing here, by the way. Keaton practiced pool for a very long time, but still needed some editing to make it look like he was the Minnesota Fats or the Fast Eddie Felson of the 1920s. Since Sherlock does not help the bad guys out and blow up during this sequence, 
this short little movie continues and then really hits its stride. A title card says the mastermind has completely solved the case, but hasn't actually found the pearls or found the guilty party. I like that sarcasm. Kudos. That was pretty good. Anyway, the guy who plays the theater manager at the beginning of the movie, Ford West, is now playing Gillette, Sherlock's loyal assistant. After the villain traps Sherlock up on a roof, our man uses a traffic gate to swing down onto a moving car. Buster's timing, as always, was impeccable. And if it wasn't, he would have been really banged up after that stunt. Twisted ankle, damaged knee, something. Dude was gutsy. The villain shows the pearls to his friends in their hideout, probably reminding us he has them as much as showing them off to his buddies. Sherlock gets dragged in and surrounded, although not immediately killed as you might expect, especially considering they tried to murder him with poison and explosives earlier in the picture. They had the drop on them. What is this, James Bond? Just kill him. And wouldn't you know it, the dastardly pearl thief has gotten one of the guys to kidnap the girl, so this case becomes bigger than just bobbles. And if you weren't already digging Sherlock Jr., there's a great trick to help win you over when Keaton dives through Gillette to escape the bad guys. The internet explains how they did this shot, so look that up if you want to learn more. It's a great effect. If someone did that trick now, we know it would be CGI, and no one would be as impressed as we are when we realize it's in-camera trickery as it is here. The extended sequence where Sherlock ends up on the back of a motorcycle after the driver gets knocked off is something else and the highlight of the whole film. You have to love the irony of Buster Keaton saying to a man who isn't even driving the bike anymore, mind you, careful or one of us might get hurt. But did Keaton ever get hurt? Or at least show the effects of the things he did for his art, either on screen or behind the scenes? You hear all the time about how talking pictures ruined his career, but what did these stunts do to his health? Was that a factor in his 1930s and beyond film career when he reached middle age? Or was this guy just made of rubber? Funny too about the talking pictures thing. He had a pretty good deep voice. You hear it in Sunset Boulevard when he's playing cards. He was no John Gilbert. Keaton ups the stunts in the last bit of the movie, riding on the handlebars of that motorcycle for several minutes and never realizing until he almost dies repeatedly that no one is driving. It makes you wonder how the motorcycle could keep going this long without anyone giving it gas. Sherlock is steering by sitting on the handlebars. Okay, but who's accelerating? Funny. Funny. So after getting control of the cycle and somehow drop kicking the butler right through a window, Junior makes off with the girl in a fancy car. The four wheel brakes work too well and the chassis stops dead on the street, while the body of the car sails into a lake with them still in it. But hey, Mr. Ingenuity turns the sunroof into a sail, and the car becomes a boat. But after taking a second to show his lady love that he has the pearls, they start to sink. Oh, but wait, we can't forget that this was all a dream. So Sherlock wakes up in the projection room. The girl, the real one, not her movie surrogate, shows up and says that her father admits he's made a terrible mistake. <whistles> Prompting Buster to mimic what he sees in the movie, even planting a quick peck on the girl's lips. Fresh. Sorry about that whistling, by the way. That was pretty weak. I think I've got to take a drink of water here. Let's go. Live drinking. Let's try the whistling again after the fact. <laughs> Still can't do it. That's not very funny either, is it? When the movie fades to black for a second and then comes back up to show the man in the movie within a movie, now has two kids, Buster seems flummoxed and Sherlock Jr. the movie comes to an end. Will the projectionist marry his real-life girl and make babies with her? Cliffhanger. Wait, I have an answer. Not on his salary. He better fast-track being a detective if he wants to pay for a wife and kids. Or maybe steal some pearls. So the cast. Buster Keaton had 150 credits as an actor and directed more than a dozen silent pictures, including this one. Of course, his red-letter title was The General, which was 18th on AFI's Top 100 list in 2007, and was coincidentally also 18th on AFI's Top 100 Laughs. He also made The Navigator in 1924, the same year as this, a comedy that also ranked on the AFI's Top 100 Laughs. I think I mentioned that Buster has a small role as himself in Sunset Boulevard, so I guess we've covered a Keaton flick a little more recently than when we did The General. Keaton also edited Sherlock Jr., as he did for The Navigator and The General. The man did it all. Catherine McGuire plays the creatively named The Girl. She was also in The Navigator, by the way. Apart from being in a few TV shows in the 50s, she had stopped acting by the late 20s. Buster's real-life dad, Joe, plays the girl's dad. He was also in The General, Our Hospitality, and Steamboat Bill Jr. Since Joseph is Buster's Christian name, I could have been calling him Junior for this entire episode. Junior, Junior. Ward Crane, who unfortunately died of pneumonia only a few years after this came out, was in nearly 50 films, including the 1925 Lon Chaney version of The Phantom of the Opera, and Erwin Connolly, who plays the murderous butler in the movie within a movie, was also in Our Hospitality and Seven Chances for Buster Keaton. The writers were Clyde Bruckman, Jean, or G probably Jean, J-E-A-N, 
Jean Hevez, and Joseph Mitchell. Bruckman was always collaborating with Keaton on these stunt fests, but he also worked regularly on feature films for other people deep into the 40s. He directed a lot too, including getting co-director credit with Keaton on The General. Havez and Mitchell joined Bruckman in regularly working with BK on these comedy outings. And the producers were Keaton himself and Joseph Schenk, who's yet another guy with repeated credits on Keaton Pictures. I have to pay a huge compliment to modern technology. I love drinking this movie in. The print on Canopy is beautiful. Canopy's thumbnail brags about it being a 4K restoration, but I don't have a 4K television, or very good eyes. Nevertheless, the film looked almost new. It's also free on YouTube, doesn't look as good there, which was helpful when I wanted to go back and look at a few scenes while writing this essay. But I'm torn on this as a finished product. I like Sherlock Jr. It's creative and it's fun. I just didn't laugh very much. Great gags can be timeless, and many of these are, but Bev and I laughed or even just chuckled far more in the last 15 or 20 minutes than we did in the first half, or even two thirds of the picture. So it ranks in the AFI's top 100 laughs, and the main reason it was on the Sight and Sound's top 100 was for the comedy, and for those creative stunts too, sure, and the influence on other movies. But I guess I just don't share the sense of humor of people who marvel at old comedies. You've heard that before on this channel if you're any kind of regular listener of us. There are some exceptions. I always laugh a lot when I watch The Lady Eve or His Girl Friday or Singing in the Rain. Singing? Singing in the Rain. But comedies that came around the time my grandparents were born are, not surprisingly, not so gut-busting to me anymore. I just bristle when movies I don't find all that funny continue to be on a pedestal, while modern comedies are so often overlooked altogether. Look at the AFI's top 100 laughs. There are very few new or even newish movies on there. They don't make them like they used to is an adage that's not only true, it's a benefit that they don't keep making them like they used to because we don't really laugh so much. We can take a lot from this era and from the remarkably talented man who made Sherlock Jr. without pretending it's still as resonant as it once was. Because I liked it, but I don't think it is. If you have ever seen Buster Keaton's 1924 comic classic and think I'm full of crap all after all I've said here, tell me all about it. I'm at moviefiend51 on Twitter. Bev, for that matter, is at Bev Ellis Ellis. Our email address is haveyouevereseenpodcast at gmail.com. Rate this podcast. Write up a review. Suggest other movies you might like to hear us discuss, whether it's me on my own or in a proper conversation with Mrs. Ellis. And spend some time scrolling back to see the hundreds of classic films that we've talked about in the past. We have quite an archive. We used to be the Top 100 Project, so if you come across our reviews of The General or Sunset Boulevard with Buster Keaton, or, well, anything up until last week, you'll hear our old name and old numbering system. It's the same people doing this, though, and the same basic podcast. Oh, and don't forget to buy some Spark Plug Coffee. You'll get that 20% discount on their fairly traded Arabic beans if you use our promo code H-Y-E-S. Or better yet, just go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. I'm back in front of the mic with another oral essay in just seven days when I talk about the Defiant Ones. Doing it on Friday the 13th lines up Stanley Kramer's Racial Tensions movie with MLK Day three days later, so Martin Luther King will be honored three days after I talk about a race movie. It also adjusts my solo shows in a different set of Every Other Fridays so that Chris and I aren't releasing a Scoring at the Movies episode the day before I post a Have You Ever Seen episode. i got to space myself out and not make you too sick of me. But the next time this channel drops a movie review will be on Monday the 9th when Bev and I discuss Steven Soderbergh's Out of Sight. Thank you so much for listening to this 483rd edition of Have You Ever Seen? Now please excuse me while I fall asleep on the job and dream of repeatedly risking my neck to save some jewels and end up sinking in a lake. It's winter. That lake is mighty cold. And good. <laughs>